welcome to the 212th meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. This is the latest in our regular monthly meetings. Tonight, we have uh, Julian Dunn here, who will be discussing uh, in his presentation, Habitat, uh, Build More Applications and Less Infrastructure, um, which is a nice, audacious uh, title. Um, I'd like to say how much we appreciate our space sponsor, Bloomberg. They're responsible for us being able to be here, uh, for the pizza, for the drinks. And um, yeah, they're providing us the space. And thank you for showing up. Today is uh, apparently a difficult day uh, for a lot of people. It's a very political day, and uh, we thank you for being here instead. Tonight, before we get started, we have our usual requests. First, silence the cell phones. Second, uh, do not eat any snacks and noisy wrappers during the presentation, or you know, take them out of the wrapper and come back in after you've done that. And lastly, uh, please use the microphones for questions. When it comes time to ask questions, actually, uh, would you prefer questions at the end, in intermittently? How would you like to do the questions? I'm going to do this at the top. I think for about 20 minutes. Great. Questions after that. Great. So we'll hold questions until that uh, intermediate period. Sorry, normally I ask that beforehand. I'm a little bit uh, scattered today. And um, anyhow, so. Please use the mics, and uh, I'd like to repeat our thanks to our regular space sponsor, Bloomberg, and acknowledge our other sponsors, past and present. They are IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and Pearson for their support. In addition, Nylook would not be able to function without our many volunteers who've contributed greatly over the years, people at the table out front, uh, well, those of us like me who are up here, people who help organize. Uh, these events don't come out of nothing, and uh, we really... Um, uh, we really care about this, and we're glad you are here to share it with us. Uh, for our announcements, uh, workshops, please talk to here, Dave or Rob, uh, about the workshops. The last one was yesterday. The next one will be November 1st, Tuesday, November 1st, from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, at City College at 138th in Amsterdam, and that will be coming up at the Meetup page. The next general meeting will be an introduction to Mesos by Skand Gupta on Wednesday, November 16th. And in case you missed it, you can grab a Linux distro DVD from back there on the windowsill. Those are free to take and to keep. Um, after the presentation, we will be heading to Jake's Saloon at 206 West 23rd Street across 7th Avenue. We'll take a walk up there as a group. Uh, and I'll mention that again at the end so no one gets lost. And remember, there will be trivia questions. There are some books to give away. So um, pay attention to that. Pay attention to the, to the presentation. And you may get a chance at a book that you are uh, interested in. Who knows? So one thing I want to mention is, if does anyone have announcements for upcoming events or anything similar that are happening in the area? Yeah, I do want to mention, I have in my email a discount code for Container Days, which will be happening in November, Container Days NYC. If that is of interest to you, come and talk to me. I'll share that with you. We may be sending that out via the Meetup, um, the meetup mailing list thing uh, a little later, but I just want to let you all have a chance at it first. Uh, there are a limited number of them, so if you're interested, come get them from me. Um, and now, uh, I would like to remind every one of our speakers by how Julian Dunn is a product manager. At, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of stuttering my way through this. So everyone, thank you. Julian Dunn is a product manager at Chef Software and works primarily on Habitat now, which is the automation solution for modern applications. He has over 15 years of experience in technology as a systems administrator and a software developer in industries as diverse as finance, media, internet security, advertising, and construction. So if any of those are of interest to you, he'll be joining us for drinks afterwards, and you can also talk to him about that. So thank you very much. Uh, everyone, please welcome Julian Dunn with Habitat, build more applications and less infrastructure. Thanks very much, Peter. OK, so. What is the audience that I have here today? Are you sysadmins? Raise your hand. Raise my hand. I've been a sysadmin longer than I've been a developer. Uh, developers who would consider themselves a developer. Okay, so about a third. What about SRE or DevOps? How many folks have that in their title? These are fancier titles for what I think are sysadmins that know how to program a little bit, right? Uh, others? Any other folks? Okay, so why is it that we run systems? Who wants to take a crack at that? Why do we run systems? So we can run our businesses. Did you look at my slides beforehand? No. We run systems to support applications. The business applications that we run are the currency that differentiates us from our competitors, right? If you're working for Chase Bank, 
the experience that your customers are getting from Chase's website, from the mobile application, the fa features in that application, those experiences that are different from Ally or Wells Fargo, well, maybe not Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo has other differentiating characteristics <laughs> that have nothing to do with the software applications. But anyway, um, software is now the currency that differentiates us from our, our competitors, right? Now, what we think is the difficulty of running applications in production where one is easy and five is difficult. Ever, ever, everyone know what a fist of five is? You know, where you, one is, one is, you roll like this, right? Five is, you know, very difficult. One is easy, five. Three, that's pretty bold. Anybody else? Yeah, I guess so, <laughs> right? So the way I think of this is actually the scale isn't quite, uh, you know, like as I said, I'm a system administrator by trade or I was before I became a product manager several years ago. And I think the scale is actually kind of unfair. It moves between something like pain in the ass and like, oh my God, I just want to die. <laughs> Running production, right? Now why is this? Why is this, the, why is this the situation? When we think of our application, we're looking at just one part. We think of this application as being just the program code, right, that differentiates us from our competitors, right? But actually, and if you think about traditional servers and how we build these servers and how they're oriented, there's actually a whole bunch of other stuff that's involved before you actually get to running the application. Now, if you're talking about servers, when I talk about servers, I also mean like, you know, VMs, including bare metal and that kind of stuff, right? Like, like physical servers. But what you would normally do is like, I have an idea, before I can even write the code for that idea, I need to know what operating system I'm on. So maybe I'm picking like Linux or Windows. Now there's fewer choices these days, right? But when I started my career, you could pick like Solaris, you could pick AIX, you could pick you know, a whole bunch of other stuff, BOS maybe, I don't know if you were crazy. Um, on top of this, you have these systems that I, that I call like workload placement. In a, metal, in, a, in a bare metal kind of uh, model, this would be like where do I put the servers, what data center do I put them in, right? In VMs, these are like you know, where, what VMware cloud or VMware installation do I put things on? Or like if I'm using AWS, like what region do I put things in? in inside those regions, what subnet do I put that stuff in? And then on top of that, if you're, let's say for example, you're writing a Java application, right? As a Java developer, you write a bunch of Java, you get some class files, you get a war file or an ear file. You can't just like run that directly. You can run that in some kind of runtime environment, right? And this is true for any other language as well, right? Not normally you can't just run something directly. I mean, it's not usually there's some kind of like layer between the OS and the actual program code, right? So in the Java world, this would be something like a servlet engine, right? JBoss, Tomcat, WebSphere, what have you. So you make some choices around that too. Then on top of that, you have this other stuff to solve around. Well, how am I actually going to deploy this application, right? How do I do like rolling deployments or zero downtime deployments or how do I connect things from one, you know, one entity to another? Um, how do I upgrade these things? How do I upgrade the underlying engine that my, you know, the runtime engine that my application is running on? A whole bunch of management problems to solve in there. Then you also have to think about, well, how do I monitor this stuff? And monitoring this stuff is distinct, again, based on the previous choices you made. So for example, if you're a JBoss shop, then probably using like JBoss operations network, or maybe you've home cooked something else to do this, right? But over in another part of your business, maybe you have some Windows, and you have some like ASP, and, or you know, C Sharp, or whatever, and it's got its whole other management tooling and all this other kind of stuff, monitoring and management tooling. Then on top of that, we have this thing, you know, we have what I call, I mean, people call this orchestration. I guess what I, I have a whole other talk, by the way. Maybe you can hear me hear, uh, hear me deliver it some other time, which is about how I actually don't like the term orchestration. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, one of which is like it means 15 different things to 15 different people. But the way I'm sort of looking at orchestration is like how do I modify, how do I log into the instances, or how do I look at stuff, right? How do I coordinate operations across a whole bunch of them? And then on top of this, there's also things like, and this is more valid for more dynamic environments, right? Not so valid for things like, you know, machines like bare metal machines and data center that have a name. But in like a cloud environment where things are coming and going all the time, Amazon takes an outage and so you know your, your VM goes away and comes back up with a different name and a different IP address. So you have to figure out how you're gonna you know bind the things that depend on it to the one to what it depends on and modify configs and all this stuff. This is what, what people call service discovery. You can use a number of solutions for this, right? People used to use DNS for this, now there's all kinds of other solutions for this, right? Um, so this is like a pretty complicated stack of stuff just before you can even get to running your application, right? 
and this is custom. This tends to be custom for each type of application and the long and the how long that application has actually been around in your company. So you end up owning a whole bunch of these different stacks, and I call these sorts of things like um, it's like a Rube Goldberg machine. You have a few of them in your company, right? And they're kind of bespoke to you. Now, containers came along. Do containers solve this? Well. Containers solve some part of it. It's helpful, right? I'm not going to diss containers. It's helpful in some way. Um, one of which is uh, the way they, the way containers work is it's like how can we figure out how to collapse the application and the runtime layer into an image that I can move around, right? But does it solve the other parts of this cake? Does it solve things like what OS am I using? No. The first line in a Docker file that says from whatever, you just made a choice about your OS, and then you're going to put in a bunch of commands in that container, run this. And as soon as you put in those, in those run commands, apt get, blah, 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 or yum install, blah, 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 right? You immediately bound yourself to that operating system. You've limited the portability of that. You've also limited, you also made it so that only somebody that knows, like, it's, I kind of refer to like, well, I've seen some pretty ugly and gnarly Docker files, and a lot of them are like, kind of like badly written Perl. You know, it's like a write-only language. You look at this thing, you have an object that you know works, you type Docker run something, you get the program running, and you're like, oh, I need to modify it. And you go look at somebody's Docker file, and you're like, what the heck is even going on in this, right? So it's kind of sometimes a write-only um, uh, interface. And then on top of this, it's like containers. Now you have more moving pieces in your environment when you're using containers. So now where do I, workload placement becomes much more important, right? Like, I've got to think about how many of these things do I want? If I want five of them for failure, you know, for redundancy, like where do I place them? And so people start using complicated systems like, you know, Kubernetes or Mesos to start describing things like, I only want three of these in one data center. I don't want to co-locate these two instances with this one over, these three over here. So if the data center goes down, I still need to have some copies running over here or whatever, right? So workload placement becomes more important. That's external to the container. Container says nothing about that. It's just an image. It doesn't know where it's being placed. Then you still have all this other stuff, right? I still have to figure out how I'm going to do deploys and upgrades. And again, this can be very tightly bound to my choice of my runtime layer, right? Like Kubernetes has a certain way of doing it. It's got blue-green. You roll things out in a certain way. Mesos has got its own thing, right? If you're using some other platform that maybe combines the two, like Rancher, they've got their own way and their own management tooling, right? So again, you're building up towards, again, a very custom stack that's centered around containers. Um, but that you're building up to solve the same problems that you had in the traditional servers, right? What do I do about monitoring? Well, containers say really nothing about how am I going to get the logs off the box, or how do I see if my workload is healthy, or all that kind of stuff, right? Or even if my container engine is working or not, right? Then on top of that, I still have this thing with orchestration, right? I mean, it kind of makes me cry a little bit when people SSH into containers and stuff like that, right? But, you know, they added Docker exec, and, and you know, there's sometimes valid use cases for seeing what the heck is even going on. Um, so you still have a rule for orchestration even in the container world, and it's external, again. And then on top of that, you again have the service discovery thing, right? I have all these containers that are running out there. How do I, how do I tell A that it depends on B so that when B moves, A is notified, right? Again, containers say nothing about how you actually solve this. So people implement external solutions, you know, like etcd, zookeeper, console, whatever, this kind of stuff, right? So it's another part of the kit that you're owning. You make a bunch of choices. So you end up with effectively the same kind of layer cake, in, even in the most modern kind of microservice-y, container -y environments, right? Now, again, we focus in on this application. I actually argue that since the application program code isn't useful unless you have all this stuff, isn't actually your application most of the stack? Shouldn't we be thinking about our applications in this way? That's actually what I argue is your application, is most of the stuff, right? And so that's sort of the principle that Habitat tries to take. Now let me take a little bit of, of a sidebar here. So I work for Chef. Habitat is an open source project by Chef. But you notice that it's Habitat by Chef. It's not Chef Habitat because it's got a bit of a set apart from Chef. It's not configuration management. There's no Ruby DSL. There's no agent. It's more for applications than for infrastructure. So you can think about Chef is for infrastructure, Habitat's for applications. But I do want to give, talk a little bit of a sidebar about automation, AKA what we would know as configuration management. How does it fit into this kind of a layer cake? Well, it actually makes this layer cake even more complicated. Because what you do is you have all these pieces, which you can set up in a non-automated way. You can log into machines and install Kubernetes and try to orchestrate and monitor and do all this stuff, container deployments and stuff like that. And then what you're going to try to do, you will try to use something like configuration management to bolt it onto the side and to try and automate it, which just adds like another 100% complexity tax 
on top of all the stuff that she already had to own, right? Actually worse is what happens is each one of these, and if you folks work in enterprises, you'll relate with me about this, right? Which is like the choices of each of these layers were made by different silos, right? So who chose the OS? Some infrastructure team, and they installed the servers, and they put RHEL on it, and they hand it over to somebody else, right? Some provisioning team or something that takes it a little bit further, maybe like a middleware team or something, right? Middleware team that installs JBoss or WebLogic or whatever on top of this, right? And then they hand this thing off to an application team who then deploys their application onto it, right? And then on top of that, you have maybe some other team, maybe an operations team, not the build team that built the application, but some ops team that went and like, you know, are the, or maybe the release engineering, right, if we're talking about deployments. Maybe they're the ones that actually get the code on the box. And then maybe you have some Knox team on top of this that's actually dealing with looking at the logs and seeing if things are red or green and responding to the pager and all this kind of stuff, right? So what happens vis-a-vis um, -vis configuration management is you ever, ever write a recipe that looks like this? Right, like I've seen, I've written recipes like this when I worked in the enterprise. And it's like, when you're doing this, like basically what you're doing is that what I'm talking about, you're sticking automation along the side and trying to, and trying to silo off. Okay, so, you know, infrastructure team owns base and the middleware team owns the second thing and some other team owns number three and some other team owns number four. Like you might as well, everyone know what Conway's law is? That's well, Conway's law is like saying that the products that your company makes are likely to architecturally resemble the silos that you have in place, right? You might as well just call your cookbook Conway's Law and upload it, right? It's like, it's kind of the wrong approach. So if you think about Habitat, we, we took a step back and we're like, what would the world actually look like if you started with the application first? If instead of designing infrastructure systems that kind of move upwards towards and to the application, what would our behaviors look like if you started with the application? And so that, if you think about our layer cake, if you will, is what Habitat is. is it's like collapsing as much of the application, the runtime, the service discovery, the monitoring, all that deployment and stuff like that, orchestration, and binding it very closely with the application package so that it moves as a unit. So in other words, describing the behavior about your application under different scenarios and how you would modify it at runtime and things like this, right, in different environments binding that behavior into the application at build time. So that's what I'm here to talk to you today about. Now what Habitat doesn't do still is, well, you still probably have to have just enough OS. And actually with Habitat, um, right now it's a Linux only project, which is fine, I'm talking to Nylog, right? Um, but you basically only need to bring a kernel, and I'll talk to you why about that why. Um, and then if, you, if you're using containers as your infrastructure environment, Habitat, is, Habitat can interact and, and can export to containers, but it's not necessary. You can get the same kind of isolation behavior um, no matter whether you're using containers or not, you want to deploy Habitat packages on VMs or on PASs or whatever, it looks the same from the outside. So it frees you from having to make infrastructure choices up front on day one, right? If you want to use containers, that's great. It doesn't mean that you're bound to it. You could also use containers in dev, use a VM or bare metal in prod, it would look the same. You have the same mutable artifact that you move from environment to environment. Well, that's sort of what Habitat looks like in comparison to everything else, right? layer cake looks a lot simpler because you're binding things together um, and that, that is the portable artifact. Okay, so in summary, uh, applications plus the dependency chain for your application um, plus the behavior of that application in different scenarios, uh, that's what Habitat is. Uh, the logo has nothing to do with uh, this. I have been asked uh, as a coincidence um, and thank you all for coming uh, instead of watching the debate. Okay, so how does this work? All right, so again, if you think about the way in which we construct things technically, you have some operating system layer, right? Think about, like I used to administer RHEL. So you get a kernel and you get some user land, all these RPMs that sit on top of the kernel. Um, that's the operating system. And then on top of that, if you're to do things like, I wanna run Java or I wanna run Ruby or whatever, but I'm like, you know, yum install Ruby or yum, yum install Rails or whatever. And then on top of that, I drop my application in some format. Now, this is obviously problematic. You can already see there's some issues, right? And how many are uh, Red Hat Linux administrators here used RHEL, right? So when you have a situation like this, it's very hard for applications to coexist with one another if they depend on the same runtime, right? So like how do you get a Ruby application that's an older version of Ruby to coexist on the same box as one that's depending on a newer version of Ruby? And so. So infrastructure first approach is to do things like SCL, right? 
and try and, and you know, it's kind of janky. It's like, ah, it's difficult. It's hard to use. You know, it's because it's not really. And, uh, and if you talk to application developers, right, they don't, they won't use that. They're just like, well, why don't I already have Bundler? Like, I just stick all my gems in. I'll just bundle Rails, and can't I just give you a zip file with my application built in, right? So there's just like this fight sort of between the application and the and the user land slash OS space, right? Now, what Habitat does functionally is it provides, so you bring a kernel to the table, and that could be any kernel. Actually, it's a kernel that has to be greater than 2.6.32. It's just a point in time that we chose when we were picking what glib, um, glibc to compile, like what flag to pass in glibc to compile against. And then we own the rest of the space, right? All the way down to everything from libc up, right? Kind of like, who's, who's played with like Nix, Nix OS? Very similar to Nix OS. Um, Nix is a little bit different in that um, and you'll see this, these concepts as I go through, right? Nix is versions the whole OS atomically, right? It's like checkpointing it in time. Um, and Habitat is more about checkpointing individual applications in time, but they can all coexist on the system, right? You can have more than one. So the operating environment for how this actually works is, this is you, you are a user that is packaging an application, and you build your application and package it in an isolated environment that we call a studio. So this would be if you've ever used something like Mock for building like on Fedora or Red Hat or whatever, right? It's an isolated cheroot effectively. Um, the implementation details for it actually under the hood because um, Habitat, the build environment is cross-platform. So on Linux, if you're building on Linux, it literally is a cheroot. Um, if you're building on Mac, which is what I'll do a little bit later, like it actually just uses Docker as the isolation mechanism, interestingly enough, and also on Windows as well. Okay, so within this studio, so you describe how you build your application by writing a plan. And a plan is effectively, it's like a, if you ever use like, um, I know I'm talking to a Linux crew here, but if you ever use like BSD kind of systems or Mac ports, it's like a, it's like a declarative uh, build system with different phases, right? You have build, you have patch, how to download stuff and whatever, but, and it's written in shell, but there's a lot of shell abstractions on top of this to do common operations, right? So it's a callback based system that you override for phases, and I'll show you that. It'll be a little bit more real when I actually uh, dive into the code. And then from this plan, you build it in this isolated environment. So the purpose of the isolated environment is to ensure that you don't have any of the host dependencies polluting the space, right? Because we want to control everything in the ecosystem. And out of this, you get a habitat artifact or a dot heart, right? Habitat artifact. Uh, also, habitat artifacts, because we love you, have a heart extension. Okay, so why, why, why build these artifacts, right? Is that just a packaging system? No, it's not just a packaging system. So the benefit of building the artifacts in this way and then by having the behavior bound closely to that, those things is that you, can, you run them under a process supervisor that we provide as well, Habsoup. This is written in Rust, um, which is a low-level systems programming language, very modern. Um, I think the next version of Firefox is being rewritten in it, in fact, it's by the folks at Mozilla. And it's a low-level systems programming language that allows you to have uh, type safety, memory safety. It does most of the checking of that kind of safety at compile time, right? So you don't have things like um, you know, use after free and this kind of thing, because it keeps track. It's pre pretty aggressive about checking for reference, uh, counting references and memory and stuff like that. And the interesting thing about our supervisor, I mean, supervisors in and of themselves aren't particularly differentiating, right? I mean, these are like run it, system D, or whatever. But what our supervisor does is it talks to other supervisors in a network. So you can kind of think of this as a mesh. And by forming this ring, the state, they can share a global state and be able to modify each other in real time, assuming they have permissions. I mean, in the demo, I'm gonna run the whole thing without any security. It's not how you would actually run the system, but I don't wanna deal with keys and stuff like that for a demo. But you know, basically, you group, you can think of these rings as they could be actually very large, as large as you want. Um, but probably you would group them by maybe like type of application, like application stack, or maybe even by business unit. Uh, but it's basically anything that needs to share state with something else, you would put into a ring, in, into the same ring. And you group the services within, uh, into service groups within that ring. So these would be like, in a service group would be something like, here are my database nodes, right? Maybe one of these, maybe this one over here uh, is the leader and there's a couple of followers. Um, and so there's a bunch of distributed systems semantic in here inside the supervisor to do things like elect a leader automatically, right? Because you think about in this database group down here, actually anybody that's consuming that up there doesn't really care who is a leader, they just need to know who it is, right? So it doesn't actually matter if there's an election that happens that, you know, who actually ends up winning that election, right? Everybody else just needs to know who the leader is, right? 
So this communication of global state happens over a protocol that's known as gossip, it's a distributed system protocol. Um, and so they can share the state about other supervisors and, and you know, grab config values out of something else and modify your own config and so on and so forth, right? Um, and so within this, it allows, you to, allows us to build other primitives on top of this and things like um, how does the application behave when it's deployed into different, what we call topologies, right? So when I was talking about that leader follower thing, that's known as a topology. Another type of topology would be like an initializer topology, which is like um, databases that need to, you can fire up five or 10 or 15 instances, but one of them has to start completely and initialize its database or something before it can, the other ones can, can proceed, right? Um, and also allows us to do things like apply update strategies per group. So things like how do you do automatic deployment of these applications, right? Like normally what we do for deployment these days is we sort of push deploy, deploy packages from some central system, like an orchestration system, right? And say you go first, then you, then you, then you, and all this, right? And so uh, instead by having these folks self-organize, they, they can implement some update strategy which is like, like imagine like a canary where you could have one of five, like out of five, five things, right, maybe only one is supposed to go at one time. Well, they could all self-coordinate and figure out who's supposed to go first and then somebody else goes and somebody else goes, right? And as long as you have some characteristics that maintain service to the consumers, that's probably fine. And so on and so forth, right? So that's a supervisor, they speak to each other and they share state. So, since this is a technical crew, it's actually more kind of like if we took the interesting properties of Nix and some concepts of the packaging system and stuck it onto the side of some of the concepts of the packaging system in Arch and then also took the process supervisor from, you know, like a system D or run it or something like that and made that supervisor network enabled and then also took some of the functionality from something like console or console template, right? And all these things got together and they had a baby. That's kind of what Habitat is. <laughs> Right? Uh, actually, a baby would probably look like this. It has to be way more nerdy, right? Okay, so that's a quick overview of Habitat. So let me break here uh, to answer any questions about the concepts before I show the system. Yeah. I'm turning it on and then I have a question, but yeah. Um, do you want to go first? Um, so I'm, I'm curious both about, is this on? Okay. Uh, both about the packaging and, and the gossiping. So you have, uh, so you, you have the, the supervisors gossiping. Uh, what, one thing is, what is the conversions time for uh, a lead, if, if a node that is leading uh, goes out, what's the conversions time for, <clears throat> for picking up another one? And second, when there is a change to the state of a system, what is the, how does that change get expressed and represented in the other supervisors and in the processes that they're running? And the third thing I'm curious about is you'd mentioned that this isn't exactly like, let's say, uh, containers. One of the sort of tenets of dealing with at least uh, Docker and usually how most people would operate these is that you have one process, let's say, per container. Um, what's your story with multiple processes that have to be uh, either coordinated or uh, run together or be visible to each other while packaging and deploying. Right. Now I forgot what your first question was, Peter. So your first question was around, was it around convergence time? Uh, convergence time because you're saying the leader, the leader election is invisible, but that the systems can sort of, the supervisors, ir irrespective of their current role as a leader or a follower, can elect to uh, do upgrades or whatever on their own, right? Which means that nece uh, necessarily once in a while a leader is going to go away and usually that's where distributed consensus gets a little trickier is in reconverging. I don't want to know how you handle that. Yeah, so, you know, without diving too deeply into sort of sophisticated distributed systems uh, concepts and the difference between Raft and Paxos and all this kind of stuff, it's, so we are not, it's not Raft. So the leader is an application level leader, right? It has nothing to do with the consensus protocol, just to be clear, right? So that's why we're not Raft, right? So in, in Raft, there is a leader, right? A right leader, you send all the rights there. Um, yeah. This is, so there's no, the leader concept is like, there's only a leader concept if your application requires a leader concept, right? These are all, but from a, from a gossip perspective, they're all equal peers, if you will. 
so they right they all they, it's like a it's like a mesh like well, i mean but but you know, uh, are you doing anything to prevent sort of n squared communication storms yeah so the thing is like it's not a directly connected mesh right so not every peer has to talk to everybody else if i can talk to you via you then i will right so um, that that's how that so and then the communication is over um, it's over UDP, right? It's a reliable UDP. So we, we're using um, UTP right now. So we're still tuning the, the implementation, but it's going to be UDP based, and that's partly to avoid um, conflicting with the actual uh, application level payload, right? The application level traffic to keep it pretty minimal um, as an eventually consistent system. So I think you asked a question around like convergence time, how long it takes. So this project is fairly young. Um, it's about four months old, and so we haven't yet scaled it up to a, um, a level that allow us to like have some metrics around that. But we can expect it to be performed very similar to how SURF performs, actually, because a lot of the concepts are very, very similar. What? SURF, uh, HashiCorp's product. So the console is built on top of SURF. Yeah, and they're using a swim-based algorithm for, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> we start deep diving into like, you know, discussions about uh, failure detector algorithms and things like that and swim. Yeah, so that was question one. What was your second question, Peter? Tied into one and two. Um, my, my second was, I think the more interesting one was the question of multiple applications that would normally expect to run together and how you can, prov whether, how, if, whatever, you can provide an environment where you can have two demons that expect to a cooperative environment or in, in a environment where they can communicate together and then deploy them and manage them together, which is not entirely uncommon, um, but which containers tend to make um, require a different mindset. And I'm wondering if you have that mindset or if you have another way of handling that, uh, in addition to having all the dependencies bundled, let's say, together so that they can't get out of sync. That's often a desirable feature when you're doing a build. Yeah, so do you mean like there's like a pattern where you have like one application payload but sort of two entry points, if you will, into the code? like? Yeah, probably be more patient. Um, well, let's say you have a client and a server and you're building them at the same time. You want them to actually run on the same system, but also be able to contact each of them, uh, other systems within the same ensemble of whatever's. Mm -hmm. um, being able to build them and run them uh, off of the same set of libraries without having to do a distinct build can be an advantage because you will get you know the better guarantee of all of the dependencies being correct at the same point in time. And again, you probably have a better story about that than some build systems, but it's not unheard of to want that quality, mm -hmm. same source code, two targets, then you run them at the same time. Uh, but they are run independently because they are separate processes with separate functions. Is that, is that something that you can support? Yes, it is. I mean, broadly speaking, I mean, there's lots of different application styles, you know, right? I mean, if you're talking about things like clients and servers, I'm assuming they're, you know, let's make some assumptions they're communicating over the network and things like this. And how do you deal with things like, oh, well, the server needs to be up before the client can connect to it or whatever. So this is what I was getting at when I talked about, like, and when I said I have another talk that's about, like, why orchestration approaches are just hard for people to understand and don't really scale, um, and why we prefer sort of more choreography type approaches. That's sort of borne out in, in Habitat's design, which is like, even if you have legacy applications, assuming you have this client and server, and even if the client can't really start until the server starts, right? So there's life cycle hooks for each phase of a process's startup. And so you can have the client do things like if it can basically watch for some state change in the server. And so the idea is like for scalable modern systems, what, what you know, orchestration approaches would be like you start and then you start and then you start after certain events have happened, right? And the model that we're, we, we're trying to move folks towards in the world is like, just figure out how to start everything up all at the same time. And then once sort of the you know, things converge, like the database is actually ready, then the user processes, the ones that are dependent on that database, if they're more legacy and they don't already know how to block based on things not being available, the lifecycle hooks that are within that client package can then signal that thing, send it a hop or something to reload it or whatever. So it does, definitely does require like a little bit more application level thinking about how to respond to different events. But I would argue that that application level thinking is what makes reliable systems anyway, right? Like if, you're, if your client can't reconnect if the server goes down and comes back up, right? If it doesn't know how to deal with that, and I've seen plenty of applications like that, then it's probably not a very reliable system anyway because like networks die all the time, right? Those things would probably not be very cloud ready, if you will, because networks are transient, right? They break all the time. So, you know, it's, um, that's sort of my, that's a short answer. I mean, there's lots of other different application styles that I've seen uh, with this. Other questions? 
track down the distributed systems rabbit hole. Um, but let's keep it short. Maybe we can take this offline if you think it's too long-winded. Gossip, at least the, the vanilla variant, that is, tends to favor availability over um, consistency. So in general, uh, you can get two parts of the network seeing different things. For instance, seeing a different value for the leader of a particular database cluster. Is that a problem? Was that a specific choice or is the gossip tuned to avoid that or can you decide to do that? Or? Yeah, there is. And you know, I would answer your question better if I'd remember the docs that I wrote four months ago to describe this, but they're all on the site. We can talk about that offline. Once I read and talk, yeah, so you know, SWIM and these kinds of protocols handle those kinds of network partitions. We have sort of some comp compensating controls for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how does Habitat's, uh, I guess, Packaging slash isolation differ from container. Docker, you have an image that the runtime is mounted into this new namespace. So Habitat provides um, similar kind of isolation, similar kind of guarantees like immutability, um, uh, atomic builds, you know, installation, and a lot of the other factors that containers uh, provide without t necessarily tying you to containers, which is why you can export to container formats from Habitat. And it also allows you to have habitats. You can think of like, because habitat locks the dependencies at the time that you build to exact version pinnings, right? So you have, so you can think of like the top level app plus the entire dependency tree is like an immutable uh, thing that you can move around, but they can also coexist with others on the same system, right? Yes, so that's what the heart is. And it may, maybe that's a little bit easier to understand when I show the runtime and we can inspect the package and I can sort of show how, how it's constructed and stuff like that. Yeah. But it provides a lot of the same powerful things that containers have brought to the fore without necessarily forcing people into containers, especially for legacy applications or things that you know, people don't want to run containers for whatever reason and so on. Yeah. Do these supervisors usually run one um, application from one habitat artifact or multiples? Yeah, so we also have this concept of a director, which is sort of like a supervisor of supervisors for, for supervising a process tree. So typically, like we started out working on this project because we saw how people were developing applications in a more container and microservice oriented way. So we started out with one app per supervisor, but we realized people are gonna wanna have in different environments a number of different processes. And so you start with a top level director and then the director supervises some supervisors, each of which supervises a process. But, and it's all very young, and you know, as we get more users, you know, what's the interesting thing about that is like, well, what ring should they be part of, right? Like, how would you deal with things like shared services? If I was running an LDAP directory in this, right, um, an LDAP directory could maybe feed more than one application, right? So should it be part of two rings at that point, or would you then run the two apps in one ring? Like, these are concepts that we haven't, we've thought about, but haven't fully fleshed out in terms of the design, but I think the, but the design and, um, and capabilities of the director and the supervisor will, will uh, change over time. Um, in fact, it could be that the director may, might not exist as sort of this top level concept, right? And we might be changing around some of the things to just be like, to make it a little bit clearer that it's not like a separate thing that we see, right? Maybe make the supervisor supervise multiple processes more easily. So we've thought about it, not totally sure on the design yet. Okay, so let me, there's gonna be a lot of, not a lot, but there's gonna be a few nodes in this demo. So I just wanna show a quick diagram so we can keep track of all the pieces, right? Because I'm gonna have terminal tabs and stuff like that. So um, what we're gonna have is, I have this Fedora box. All I'm using is this as a utility box, right? I just have a couple utilities on there like LAS and WGET and stuff like that. And I've installed the HAB binary, which is the single entry point for, for doing anything with Habitat. Just put it on this box. And then um, because it's a mesh, right? I actually don't need to communicate with the individual things that I'm actually gonna be running, right? I don't need to communicate with the MongoDB or the, my application, my Java app, in order to inject and modify state in this thing, right? Um, so I'm gonna set up a management peer. I'm just gonna run an application in this, um, it actually could be anything, right? So you would normally have in one of these systems, you'd have one or more of what we call permanent peers. These permanent peers are, are peers that could never be killed by the, um, by the failure detector, right? So normally you try to keep them up as much as possible. Um, even if they die, the, they will never be expired from the membership list in the census, right? Um, unlike non-permanent peers. 
So on the management peer, I'm gonna run this program called Prism, which doesn't actually matter what it is that I'm running. Prism just happens to be, and you might be asking like, uh, open source project, Chef is a software company that makes money, like how the heck is Chef monetizing this? Like why do we invest millions of dollars in building this? Um, part of it is we are, you know, this is a, it's an on-ramp to the commercial platform, which is called Chef Automate, and that's a workflow platform plus a visibility platform for you to see what's going on in your, in your estate, right? And that visibility stuff is like infrastructure changes plus your application changes. This thing called Prism just happens to be like a data collector and it taps the ring and it can send data into our visibility system and then you can draw graphs and do all this kind of stuff and correlate it with your infrastructure changes and yada yada. But um, I don't actually have uh, Automate up and running so it's gonna spew a bunch of errors and it doesn't really matter, right? That's the, that's the node that I'm injecting commands into to, to, change, the, to change the state, right? So when, when this Java app starts up, I'm gonna point it at the management peer so it can discover where the database is, right? Otherwise, if I pointed it to Mongo, it would work too, but it would look like I was cheating. I don't wanna be cheating. Um, so uh, let's see if I can keep this, uh, I'm gonna to have to just switch over to mirror displays for a second. Keep this up in the maybe the background. Uh, actually, that can be a little difficult because my terminal is going to take up all the room. Okay, so here's my Fedora box, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to run. Oops, hold on. Let me make this font larger. I'm going to run this whole demo using Docker, um, but it has nothing to do. Again, there's not a tight coupling between Docker and Habitat, right? And the reason I'm running it in Docker is because it's like really handy for me to be able to spin stuff up on my Mac workstation and also be able to set, the, set up this like private network where all these things can talk and so on and so forth, right? So this Fedora box is already running as a Docker container into which I just installed some stuff before I got here. Um, so okay, if I start this thing Prism, and I'm gonna say a permanent peer for flags that are passed to the supervisor. So it's, to bootstrap this system, write this ring. But see, like, the user process is started by the supervisor, and you can see it's spitting out a bunch of stuff, right? So all processes belong to a group, service group. I could start more than one, and they share the config. So if I apply config change to a group, it, it's distributed to all members of that group, right? Um, and you can see it's saying it's doing a bunch of stuff with so census and gossip and whatever. So I have this IP address, 172.17.2. So this thing's gonna spew some errors because I have no place to send the data um, from this thing. But, oops. Okay, if I run, um, I'm gonna join this to, right? Yeah. I'm gonna join my Mongo so that the state can be communicated through to the Java layer when I start the Java uh, container, right? So Mongo's up, and if I look at, actually let me, um, let's inspect, let's talk a little bit about like you know, what's inside this package, right? So let me just look inside the Docker container, and I'll just poke around a bit and show you some stuff. So, uh, Okay, so I'm inside this container. And if you notice how this container is built, there's no user land in here, right? There's nothing in lib. lib. But everything is off in hab. Okay, so only the stuff that was uh, needed for this Mongo to run that was described as part of the build plans in this image, right? Um, so if you look in, it's almost like building an entire, anybody use like Linux from scratch before? Right, built your own Linux system? That's basically what this looks like, right? So you re relocate an entire Linux system over into slash hab, which is what Nix would do, only they relocate it into slash Nix. Um, and so in here, you have all these, so this is what a package, an unpacked package looks like, this Mongo package, right? So inside here is like, you know, if I go into bin, I do something like LED MongoD. You notice that all the dependencies are, are linked to only things that already exist in the Habitat ecosystem and are bound to exact versions and releases of those libraries, right? 
It allows you interesting properties like if I needed to find out which of my workloads was vulnerable to a security vulnerability like glibc having you know the DNS issue or whatever, right? I can immediately look at this because this is all built in and locked at the time that it was built, right? There's a bunch of metadata that goes along with this package. So you can see it's got things like what are its direct depths, what are its transitive depths. It's got, um, you know, what else is in here? It's got files and so on and so forth. Okay, so all this information, by the way, is exposed as an HTTP interface on the side of that process supervisor. So um, what's the IP address of this thing? Um, I am 173.3. So if I I can see things like I can also see things like what are the configurable elements that the user who, who described who built this package wanted to let me tune and modify and poke at at, config, at, at the runtime, right? So these are the knobs that were described in the plan as being tunable and everything else is not tunable about this Mongo. And then within the package, all this stuff is exposed as like, here's all the information about the package, all its dependencies, what version it was, right, where all, its, all the directories of the dependencies are and so on and so forth. So this is what I talk about when it's like, why this, this data stream is, can then be sent to our commercial platform for folks to look at and, and you, can, you can imagine the number of use cases for this, right? What things do I need to upgrade out in my fleet of my applications because there's a bug or a security vulnerability or whatever? That's an interesting use case, right? I can immediately ask that question, run some reports and things like that. Okay, so that's, that's the runtime environment. Now what I'm gonna do is, um, let me get out of this container. I'm gonna um, use the built-in service discovery. Um, start with this app called National Parks. And I need to point it at this peer, right? The management peer, this collector thing. What's this IP address? Dot o dot two, right? I'm gonna do this thing called bind. This is what we call, this is the service discovery, right? So you have this anonymous variable, this National Parks app, which is a Java app that depends on Mongo. It's got this anonymous variable as part of its config that says, I need a database, and, I, and so at runtime, what I need to do is to resolve that database to an actual name of a service group that's running in this ring, right? And so if I do this, I'm contacting the, the entry point, the peer, the management peer, and, and asking it, which, which is the, you know, find me the MongoDB service group and find me the leader of it. And then I'm gonna resolve those references to database and substitute them in the config before I start it up, right? So you'll notice, like if I start this up, right, it's Java, 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 my output, right? So it's figured out a supervisor has joined the gossip here and has figured out that the database is on 172.17.0.3 and is passing this to rewrite, the supervisor will rewrite the configs of this application to, to you know, set up the correct JDBC string or whatever and then set up the Mongo import. So Mongo import connects to that database, right, sends it the data that it needs to to start up and starts up this app. It's actually quite a nice app. Um, It has properties, yeah, so, yeah, not quite that specific, but it's got things like, um, you know, because it's bound to a service group, and then you can interrogate this, you can interrogate that service group for information about it, right? So in this case, there's no topology, because I'm just running one Mongo, but if I was running a leader follower, right, you could then be like, you know, loop through the members of this thing that's now been, been resolved to database and find me the leader. Right, and then I can poke into that object and find the IP, the port, like all the other stuff. Like all those things that I showed you before when I poked the supervisor HTTP interface, you could use any of those stuff if they're of use to you. Right. Yeah, so all that substitution is done by, by basically you write expressions in, in, the, in the config template of that application um, in handlebars. If you ever use it, which is like basically like a templating language, but it has a little bit of control flow in it, right? You can't call arbitrary functions, but you can have iterators, you can have loops, you can have variable substitution and things like that. All 
All right, so nice app, right? It's all the national parks. It's like the 150th anniversary of the national park system or something this year, right? Uh, something like that. So go and check out your national park. So that, anyway, overall, like that's how, and so some service discovery in there. I showed some, um, you know, some of the information about like how you could modify certain config variables. There's only two things. Unfortunately, this plan, this MongoDB plan, which I'm still working on a little bit, there's not a lot that's tunable. Right now, the only things that are tunable are the replica set name um, and the port, which isn't that useful. But basically, the thing, what you could do is like, um, I forget what that variable is, like um, REPL set name. So I could do things like, this is my Fedora box again, right? So this is how you would um, apply config to the system. So if I, you know, I wrote this new TOML file and then I can, you know, uh, check the syntax. So I would, you know, target the service group, version number, uh, say what peer I want to inject it into. So I want to target the management peer, right? And, you know, right. So how you would like inject that new config into the system. And then over here in the Mongo, right, when supervisors like, all right, I got something off the network. I and mean, again, I'm running this whole thing with no trust, right? So normally you want to have some like trust relationships and stuff like that, but for the purposes of a demo, it's fine. Um, so the supervisor's like, I got, I noticed there's a new state, a new version, um, and the lifecycle hook, there's not one defined for Mongo, right? But there's a lifecycle hook called config update, or update config or something like that, right? And that's like, what should I do if I get something off the network? And so in this case, because there isn't one, the default handler is just sig term the process and restart it with the new config, right? So it started, um, and I think there's probably some issues here with like Mongo is a little bit slow to shut down, which is why it's complaining that the port's still in use, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, you know, Mongo is giving me trouble. Um, but anyway, that's the runtime system of Habitat. So in terms of the build time environment, let's talk about, um, let me go to like where I built this stuff, what that looks like. Well, let me find a plan that's really easy to build. Let's build that um, National Parks plan. So in the build time environment, the plan just looks like, as I said, it's a shell-based build system. So you got a bunch of metadata about the plan, right? It's a sample, this is a sample Java web app, so on and so forth, right? We've got some dependencies, it's got some build time dependencies, like I need Git to check out the code, I need Maven to build a Java file, and so on and so forth, right? And then because it's a callback type system, you have default behavior that the build system provides. How do I get certain types of artifacts? How do I patch them, things like that? So you just need to override the clauses, and everybody knows how to write shell, right? So you just override the clauses that you need to to build this thing, right? Um, all the packages are signed with Blake 2B um, uh, hashing or uh, cryptographic signing system, which is a modern modern um, hashing algorithm and signed with like libsodium and stuff like that. Um, so if I do this, so you enter this studio, which is the isolated build environment to build this thing. Let me just go in here. So I have. Um, a key that I've already generated, uh, my JDAN key, and, and that's on my host. <clears throat> if I enter this studio, that key is passed into the build environment, as you see, right, the secret signing key. And then if I build this thing, it's downloading all the build time dependencies that it needs, plus all the runtime depths um, that, that go in this thing, right? And it's gonna take a little bit of time. Uh, but you notice that like there's a lot of stuff that you know something like Java would need to depend on, right? For some reason you need Perl, I don't know why. Um, curses, right? It's almost like you know it's like you since we own most of the OS, like there's quite a bit of you, you, it's interesting how dependencies are cons you know like what things depend on certain others in you know, an OS, right? I got a JDK in here that I need. By the way, like while this is building, like I'll show you that. And the good thing about this, this kind of a system is it's not only useful, and we, took, we, we borrowed liberally from how, again, Nix did it, which is like, it's not necessary to build everything from source in order to get the management benefits or the runtime benefits of something like, um, something like Habitat, right? Like you can use, uh, let me just kill this thing. Um, You can, you can patch existing binary applications to make them fit within this system, right? You just need to do tricks like, have you ever used patch elf? You know what that is? Patch elf is a utility that allows you to modify the symbol table of already created dynamic executables. Um, it allows you to do things like modify the interpreter, right? So if you have a binary, 
like think about Oracle. Oracle, you get Oracle 11G or something like that, right? And it's gonna be the simple table is gonna say, I need LD Linux blah, 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 dot SO.2 dot and slash lib. Well, you could, I mean, you probably void your warranty with Oracle, but you could modify the symbol table of that to relocate it over into Hab's version, right? Which is exactly what this is doing. My Mongo plan, I'm downloading the binary Mongo distribution and I'm doing thing like, I'm doing, I'm using patch elf to patch the symbol table to set the interpreter to, to our version of LD Linux and then also set the R path, which is like the path that it's gonna search for GCC libs in this executable to our version, right? So this is how you can like force legacy applications and things like this, this into this kind of a system to get you the isolation that you need, right? Um, patch up is a next utility, which is, um, you know, it's pretty cool that they wrote that, they borrowed that. Okay, yeah. Uh, the hope is that one will not have to figure out which parts of distributions to patch, but if this takes off, then there will be, just like there is a Docker hub, there will be a hub of these things that you can just download and run. That's right, that's right. So there's this repository called, and looks like my SSL connection got terminated, which is why this maven blew up on me, but um, oh, whoops. I have this profile with a large font. I keep forgetting to use it. Um, so we have this thing called um, core plans. You already see there's a lot of user land, there's a lot of software in here already, right? Um, Right, there's 252 packages in here already. And this is like, you know, a lot of stuff. And, you know, the idea is that you have, once you have a lot of these parts in here, people can just reuse them, right? So you can inherit from things that you can see that that Java app used a bunch of parts from this kit already, right? It, has a, it needs a JDK, which is in here. It needs Maven, which is in here. It needs Git, which is in here, and so on and so forth, right? Um, okay, so let me just fast forward. Um, so let's forget about building this thing. So. Uh, because my network connection got terminated. So from here, you can do things like, you can export these artifacts to different formats, right? So um, I can export this thing to, I think right now we have, you can export to Docker, ACI, um, the Mesos format runtime package, which is like their kind of their own RugaFast kind of container image. Um, or you can export to like a tar.gz. Um, which is basically like the moral equivalent of tarring up slash hab and handing it to you, and then you can just dr drop that on any machine with a supervisor and away you go. Um, we imagine that people will want to be contributing. And part of the reason why this is open source is like there's a lot of, there's a lot in this kit, right? Um, that it's a good foundation, and we think that people are going to want to build a lot of, a lot of different areas, right? So one area that I think people are going to want to build is in different exporters, right? You could export these things to AMIs, for example, or maybe invoking Packer or or, or even like has like Heroku build packs or Cloud Foundry build packs or like that kind of stuff, right? Then I export one of these things to, let's export my Mongo, let's export um, something fast, Redis maybe. So in this case, right, I'm basically, and once this, hopefully the network connection holds up for me to be, me to be able to do this. Um, the way this currently works in this environment is, so I already am, it's like, I'm already using Docker on my Mac, so it's just like, I just fed the, like the studio just fed the the socket through to the, um, from the host to the studio. And then it's gonna basically create a rootfs out of slash hab, drop in a few bits, and then like feed that to the, here, right? It's creating a scratch image, right? And then setting up a path, and then it's created a rootfs that it's then feeding to the Docker engine to create this image, right? And that image, as I showed you before, is gonna end up um, being pretty small. Um, right, it's 161.1 .1, uh, megabytes because it just contains slash hab, which is effectively Redis, plus all of its dependencies all the way down to glibc, which is actually smaller than the official Redis image, which is about 185 megs, because they're building it from the other direction, right? They're starting with Alpine Linux or, or whatever, right? Debbie and Jesse, and then they're building up whereas we're building down. Um, okay, so that's that was the runtime system and that was the build time system. So are there any other questions I can answer about Habitat before I kind of wrap up? So you're referring to it as a, a system that, that is uh, a self-contained supervisor. Um, it does seem though that this supervisor needs to in turn be supervised by something else 
which is in your case, you have, what did you call it again? The court coordinator? The di director. The director. There we go. You could also write a system D unit file or something, mm -hmm. which I call the supervisor, which is how we run it in production. All right. Yeah. Um, how many layers deep is that cake going to end up? That's about it. That's two layers. Okay. And what about, uh, and what about uh, coordinating this or managing it alongside something like a Kubernetes or a Mesos uh, installation where you're going to be launching it? Does that uh, coexist, uh, coexist well in your experience? Yeah, we're still doing a bunch of um, work with a lot of the different groups that are uh, using Kubernetes to figure out the integration points. I think it's kind of like a Venn diagram, right? Like there's things that we do well, there's things that they do well, like that, that we don't do at all, right? Like the workload placement specifically, right? Like we don't, there's nothing in here that ties you to a particular scheduler where you put these pieces, right? Um, so I'm spending time as the product person working with a lot of those folks and figuring out like what's the joint go-to-market story um, with Kubernetes for sure. You alluded to there being policies for what to do upon change of a variable in the uh, supervisor's configuration. Mm -hmm. I guess, I mean, I'm, I think I'm using the terminology incorrectly as it's new to me. What, ch what are the range of choices you have in order to say, look, I've, I've now added a new configuration. What actions can be taken and what lo is there any logic that can go in there? Is it like one policy per, per supervisor or is it you know, this change will result in a deferred, like I wait for the application to probe it when it's ready, this change will cause a hub, this change will tell it to do something else, call a, let's say a service within the image that will, uh, or a program within the image that will run some action, et cetera, et cetera. Like, do you have uh, granularity on what actions you can take and what responses you can offer? Yes, only because we don't to prescribe what actions can be taken in there, right? I think you're. I think you're right. So right now, the hook system, the lifecycle hook system, it just calls shell scripts, right? Um, and I think in the future you'll see things like, right, when there's a config change applied to a service group, there's probably in real life scenarios going to be peer coordination. Again, things like maintenance window policy, right? Am I in a maintenance window? Okay, so how do I find that out, right? Or things like. Okay, so all of us, all five of us in the service group got, got a configuration update. Now, how should we roll that out? Should we do it one at a time? Again, right, should maybe three of us take it and two of them, you know, continue maintaining service, right? What does that mean for, like, then distributing the information outward? So how, how you know, entities outward that are observing it know not to send traffic there. So I think as we, as we work with customers and throw more real applications at that, we'll see a lot more of those use cases expressed. There's nothing in the framework that forces you to not do those kinds of activities right now or to do them. You already have these core plans and you already have some, some service that allows you to download binaries for the, for the packages and core plans, right? Um, do you have a way of saying, oh, I deployed these binaries now and I want to keep them forever because I want to be able to roll back to exactly that state at some point, maybe. Yep. So, and if, I mean, in Nix, you have the problem that, that the Nix store just grows very fast mm -hmm. and then you garbage collect, but then there's no easy way to say which, one, which ones you want to keep. Do you have a solution for that? Yeah, so there's a couple of answers. Like, one is, can you roll back a version? Yes, you can. Like, when you do, when I did things like, um, here, let me, um, oh, how do I best show this? Let me, let me do it like this. I could do things like, like this identifier here. I could then, I could specify more parts of the quad in order to start older versions, right? This will take latest. I could also just take, what is the latest of the vendor version? I forget what this is, right? 329, right? The latest build. Or I could specify the full package ident, whatever. And, and if, you, if you had a plan, I think the example plan that you showed uh, specified dependencies without the exact version. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you, can you rebuild or can you, I mean, then it will just take the latest versions, right? Yeah. And then you want to at some point maybe be able to reproduce that exact thing, mm -hmm. even though. Yeah, like, like a dependency freeze, like a transitive dependency freeze for everything you, you build. You, you can specify the pinning in the plan if you want. Oh, but you can build plants that might not be reproducible if you throw away your binaries. 
I suppose that's true. If you needed to, if you were like, I absolutely want to control every version. I never want to move. I never want. I want to make sure that the A that depends on B and C is locked to that version. Then you could definitely, in the plan for A, write the versions for B and C, the exact versions, if you wanted to. Yeah. So I mean, the, the use case is exactly that you that you have a production system and then you deploy a new version and then something goes wrong mm -hmm. and you want to roll back and you want to roll back to exactly the same thing that you had before. Yeah. You don't want. To, to switch out the the, the C lib ever right um, and one one way to do this is just to keep the binaries yep but then you would have to have a repository where you can say oh this this set of binaries is actually important this is deployed to production and some other sets of binaries are only used for development and you can you can garbage collect them at some point yeah or you somehow have perfect reproducibility. Yeah, so we're taking the first approach. So one part, one component of the system that I didn't touch on because it's not totally, I didn't want to confuse folks. It's not really germane to the build and run, but it's sort of the third leg of the, of the thing. is like, how do you get the thing from build to run? And so you're right that this package repository contains like all the versions of the program plus all of its dependencies in time. That's true, right? And how we see that integrating with things like continuous deployment is we have these things called channels in that, in that artifact system, right? And basically a channel is like a materialized view over that system of like a point in time, of like what's running what, right? And the, then the relationship between the name of that view is the, the name of that view can be fed to a supervisor so it knows to always watch that view, right? And so the supervisor, so your effectively your deployment amounts to moving the view as you update things. So you always know what's actually running against in, in particular supervisors, right? So you kind of know like what things you need to keep around, what things you don't, because they're reflective of what's actually running in a real environment. Yeah. Yeah, because you're starting at the root of the application and you can draw the you can draw the whole tree. So effectively, yes, the view, that's why I call it a materialized view. It's a view over the whole depot of all the packages that it needs to satisfy that application. I'm going to go on for a long time. I think this whole discussion I think is very interesting. But uh, so I think a couple of things. First of all, a question around um, dependency or verifying that, that all the dependencies that you want or express um, are actually available. Um, and I'm assuming that happens. I'm guessing that you know, if I make a say I try to deploy a new version of you know national parks and it needs a version of MongoDB that I might have had in dev or I might have deployed locally, but that isn't actually available in production, when will I find out? Will I find out when I issue the hab start or hab update command? Or will I, yeah, so it's like OSGI kind of thing. It says, bang, can't satisfy your dependency tree. Right, okay. so there's a couple of strategies, right? Like one is this export to an image or a tarball, and then that's like your, the mutable thing you move around. So that's what I mean by it's sort of independent to the person I asked about the containers, right? That's how it's independent of the format. You get the same kind of immutability if you want it. But if you were to do, like I think when I started, you know, if I do, um, let's let's start something that I don't have here, right? Like Redis, that's a good one. Um, so first, I don't have the soup, so it needs to download the soup from the depot. And by the way, you can point it to another depot URL too, right? Um, which we're, eh, the the code is fine. It's just the packaging right now doesn't allow you to run a private depot very easily. But that's something that we're looking into. Um, in this case, I don't have a user, so let me I need a have user before I can run this. Thing. And just to be clear, my my question maybe wasn't clear enough. It's it's not so much dependencies that would exist within one heart, but between different, you know, the classic one is, you know, team A is building app that talks to the API of team B, and they make a change in API B, and it's now up to, you know, semantic, semver version, whatever, and I want to deploy a new version of this, but it needs a new version of that. And so I declare, I'm assuming we didn't go into this in detail, I'm assuming I can declare some dependency, like I can't boot without blah, and then that gets verified when I try to update it, not right. after it boots. Yeah. So you lock all the depths at the time that you build, and so they have to all be available to the, to the level of pinning that you need, right? So it's going to fail to build if it can't find those artifacts at all, right? It doesn't defer, doesn't defer the finding of the dependencies to the, to the runtime. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, so the, here you're talking about build time dependencies. I mean, like, I need to call an API, you know, my, my app needs a database. Like, I'm not going to include the database in my build. It's just a runtime requirement. Yeah, yeah, the, the, basically this is almost getting into the service discovery slash dependency bit. Like if I declare a dependency on a service, when, how does the validation happen? How much flexibility do I get in saying I can't boot national parks without Mongo? 
Yeah, I think we're sort of crossing the streams a little bit into like, you know, they're talking about like API versions and things exactly, like that. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. So. Um, I mean, unless you can figure out, unless you can express it as a pinning against the packaging, like we're sort of like talking about two things, like there's sort of a package, package level dependencies, but there's also sort of like, you know, the, the network level API dependencies. And things like so that. so it's, it's basically about teams having good versioning practices where you can express this kind of dependency in the artifact version. In the packaging yeah, system, yeah, okay. yeah, that's, yeah. And I guess the one other one, this is certainly a big pain with, I don't know, for, for me, uh, going through pre-built Docker images is figuring out which environment variables I can set and what they do. And uh, some people are really good at documenting that and some people are really terrible at that. And going back to what, so I thought it was interesting that uh, clearly here the idea is that you can update a config. So does the, the, does the config plus the artifact version, does that ever exist as a, you know, as, as an audit, auditable trail so that because, and, and I mean, the app itself is fine, but it's the app plus the config that determines what actually happens. Yeah, so, so there's is a... that tracked somewhere? Yeah, so there's a couple of answers to that, right? So I, you know, one thing I didn't, one thing I neglected to show off is like how, you know, these are the knobs that I set to be tunable about my MongoDB, right? And that's the only interface, and, and so these are the knobs that I can tune, nothing else is tunable about it, right? Um, and how this maps to, by the way, the config, you know, oops, awful, like, how did it config problem, right? Because you're just using mustache substitutions in this. Um, to your question about the auditability of like who's changing what and whatever and what's the current state and stuff like that, that's this Prism program that I was talking about, right? Which is like an observer of the events that are happening in the system. Uh, and of course, you probably wouldn't in a real life scenario just type have config apply and just like blast toml at your production system without any checks and controls. Seen people do that, right? I've seen people do that, right? But it's also the same people that are like pushing Docker images that they built on their laptop directly into prod, right? So it's like not, you know, if you have some discipline in your company around how you make change, then you're probably gonna put that change through like a workflow system, right? Like Chef Automate or Jenkins or whatever. And from that kind of system, you have presumably some kind of data. And you know, if you're using Chef's products, like that data about how you make those changes also goes into our visibility system. So you have ability to correlate build time change events plus your runtime change events through that system, right? Uh, you showed Habitat Studio. Can I use that for um, spinning up dependencies for development? So if, if I write an application that depends on Redis, for example, I want to have a Redis instance running on my local machine to run the test suite, for example. Can I do that? You, you could. I, um, that's not what it's intended for, but there's nothing to stop you from doing it. I mean, in the sense of like, it's primary purpose and where it's oriented towards is like an isolated transient environment for building packages, right? But it, it has some capabilities, like after I built this package, am I still in the studio? Yeah, like I could start this, right? I could actually start, um, what's this thing? When I build Core Redis, I could start this within here. Um, the problem with this is like this environment doesn't forward ports and things like that, so you can't access it from the, from the outside. So it's not really intended for that kind of a use case. For this would be there, right? Would be in the plan. I mean, the, the, the plan specifies which which services this needs and which parts this exposes, I guess. Oh. Yes. Um, information is there that it could just spin up in a development environment where you can start your application. Uh, for for like actually modifying the code and stuff like that. Yeah. Like the application code. Yeah, where you where you think it's a bit related to to his question. Where when will you figure out that you that you actually need a Redis instance, right? If you if you have developers that uh, on their on their local machines just install Redis instances manually, then you might never figure that out before someone puts that on QA or whatever, wherever, right? But if you if you were to use this and you have to specify the Redis instance in the plan in order to get it to run to 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 actually do any development. Mm -hmm. Hmm, that's interesting. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Could I have a Docker Compose? Yes, exactly. It's a replacement for Docker Compose. Spin up, spin up all the things, basically. Yeah, yeah or, or also for new developers, right? Like you have a project that has like three uh, runtime dependencies, and a new developer can just say like, well, I don't care what these are and how to set them up, but I just want to, want to have them and run the test suite and be able to spin up uh, an instance menu. Yeah. This conversation again.
Yeah, let's talk about it later. I hadn't thought about that use case, but yeah. Yeah, did I throw enough Linux internals and stuff like that? All right. Uh, so yeah, so Julian has trivia. We have um, four books today, so four questions. Four questions. I wrote them on the subway, so. Uh, so which, first question, which subway was Julian on? Second question, <laughs> standing or sitting? Third question, did he lean on the door? Fourth question. Yeah. Okay, um, let's go for this one. Uh, how, you're gonna, you're gonna so here's what we're gonna do, right. If you think you know the answer, raise your hand, we'll try to call, I'll look around. First hand I see go up, I will call on, and if you get the right answer, then you get the book, and if not, then we'll call the next person. So. Okay, uh, what is one format you may export Habitat packages to? Want it? Are you gonna do the other three formats now? Are you going to do the other three formats now? The other three formats? Oh, <laughs> I, no, no, yeah, just... I can. The other three formats that I can export to are ACIs, uh, the Mesos format container, whatever they're calling it. Yeah, it's a it's a special TarGZ, and then the, and then we can also just export a TarGZ if you want it. I was just going to ask if those were the next four, next three questions. They're not the next three questions. <laughs> no. Um, here's one. Um, what is one of the distributed systems protocols that Habitat Supervisor uses under the hood? You in the back there? Sure, I'll take it. All right, come on, get a book. Come on up. Too much books? There's books. Never... All right, well, we have three more questions then, Julian. Well, good. It's a good thing I wrote a few extras uh, in case people didn't want books, right? Um, okay. Okay, besides the application itself, Name one thing that is inside a Habitat package. Uh, go ahead. What's that? A runtime? Take that? No, not, not really. I see where you're going with this. I think he's talking about the actual, uh, an actual thing. Yeah, when I was poking around in that package, what, what were some of the things I was poking around in? Showing. And this is open to everyone again, I think. You need your hand up. All right. Well, I think I think both of you are thinking about the stacks that were being described earlier, not the actual package format. Is yeah, that yeah. what I'm getting? Yeah. When I was poking around on the file system and looking through the directory where where I had unpacked that Mongo package, what else is in there? Uh, sure. Uh, I guess I'll take it. Yeah, it's maybe a little bit arcane. Maybe, sure, uh, come on up. Yeah, have a book. It's, well, there's stuff in there like um, the metadata around the the dependencies, the transitive dependencies, all the build time instructions, yeah, and stuff like that. But right, I know right, it's right. a little bit arcane. Um, free book. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's try something. Would you have accepted the supervisor? Uh, yeah. I, I guess it's not really in the habitat package, but it's you know it's in the it's in the file system location, which actually is a question that I wrote. Uh, what is the file system location under which all habitat artifacts live? Anybody? You, sir. Flash hab. Come on up, grab a book, sir. Okay, <laughs> this one. Uh, what is the name of the isolated environment in which habitat packages are built? Yes, but you already got. You one. already do have a book, so uh, we, do we have any more, any more questions? I do have more questions. Um, this one's easy. Uh, in what language do you write habitat plans? All right, it is last book taken. Whichever book is the not, last. Not corn book shell, though. It has to be a uh, corn shell. That's All right. Good. Do you want to ask any more questions just for the heck of it? For the kudos, do you maybe have some stickers? It's bash. It's not, it's not porn shell. No one has a corn shell anymore, or a porn yeah. shell. Everyone uses bash. Everyone uses bash, except those people. Everyone on, hates it, but everyone uses on it. On AIX, people don't, you don't have bash. Right, they have a license, that's true. <clears throat> you don't have, you also don't have a real corn shell. You just have yeah. the fake corn shell with no history. We had David Korn come and speak many, many years ago. Did you really? Yeah. Okay, so I do have some stickers. 
um, which I will leave. Which I leave them. Well, how about how about this? Uh, we have we'll take them up to the front as we're getting out. I think everyone. Then I think thank you very much, Julian. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be Thanks heading over coming. to the bar.